Good afternoon, everyone. We'll just give it one more minute and uh, to allow a couple more people to join, but thank you for joining. Okay, so it's one minute past. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and good evening and good morning, depending on where you are around the world. Thank you for joining this event today. My name is Isabella Chase, and I am a research fellow here at the Center for Financial Crime and Security Studies at RUSI, and I will be your chair for today's event. Before we begin, um, I would encourage you to take a quick look at the information on the screen, and I will remind you that this event is being recorded, and that includes the Q&A at the end of the session. If you'd like to ask a question, we really encourage that. We love uh, to hear what you have to say. Uh, so please do so using the question and answer function that you should be able to find in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And today we'll be using the upvote function. So if you see a question that you would really like to hear the answer to, please give it a vote and it will rise to the top of the list and we will do our best to answer it. So, to begin this event on the FATF standards and unintended consequences evaluating the present. I will briefly explain why we're looking at this topic today and then I will join, uh, I will introduce our excellent panelists who are with us today. We'll dive into our discussion and then we will open the floor to your questions. So why are we looking at this topic today? Well, as I'm sure many of you are aware, earlier this year, FATAF launched its project on unintended consequences, which in their own words, aims to study and mitigate the unintended consequences that can result from the incorrect implementation of the FATAF standards. This project aims to look at four key areas, and these are de-risking, financial exclusion, targeting of NPOs, and the curtailment of human rights. Since launching this project, FATAF has completed its first phase by performing a stock take of what is known about these topic areas. It'll now move into phase two, where it will begin to try and find solutions to the problems it has identified. As you all know, here at RUSI, we spend a lot of our time working and uh, tracking the outputs of the Financial Action Task Force. So when this excellent initiative was announced, we thought it would be fitting to set up a series of three webinars to bring some new voices to this debate and to allow us to consider FATF's past, present and future relationship with unintended consequences. The first webinar in this series took place last week and you can find a recording of it on the RUSI website as well as the RUSI YouTube channel. Session one looked back and it assessed the past efforts by FATF to reverse unintended consequences, specifically on the NPO sector, money service businesses and on correspondent banking, and considered what we could learn from those past experiences as we move forward. Today, you join us for our second session in this series where we're looking at the present and the current challenges that the FATF faces from unintended consequences. To do so, we've decided to really focus on financial exclusion in this uh, session. And we've selected this topic because over the past 18 months, it seems that the momentum around financial exclusion has really taken off, both um, as a response to the pandemic, but also in the work that we see from FATF itself. So for, for those who might be new to this topic, why should we care about financial exclusion and, and why do we talk about it in the context of FATF? Well, it's argued that the FATF standards, when applied disproportionately, can place unreachable expectations on some of the poorest and most disadvantaged people in this world, making it nearly impossible for them to access formal financial services, which could be used to bring them out of poverty. In addition, leaving these people excluded from the financial system also undermines its, its integrity, forcing these people to use unregulated channels, which increase money laundering and terrorist financing risks in an economy 
which of course the FATF system itself is designed to curtail. At this point, I will note that we're not saying in any way, shape or form that FATF is solely responsible for the problem of financial exclusion. Financial inclusion is constrained by a huge range of factors and these differ across continents, across countries and even within countries themselves. But today to consider this unintended consequence of FATF on financial inclusion, I'm very fortunate to be joined by this uh, really expert panel that you see before yourselves. Uh, we are joined by Maha Buhu, the CEO of the Jordan Payments and Clearing Company, Adam Anklewicz, the MRLO at uh, Revolut Poland, and Barry Cooper, the Technical Director at Semfree. So thank you so much all for joining us today. It's great to have you here. Before we jump into our discussion, I'll just remind our audience, if you have a question, please don't hesitate to ask it. So to get going, we have the FATF system and we know it gives us this unintended consequence of financial exclusion, but I wanna hear from the panel, what does this look like in reality on the ground? Can you give us a sense of what you've seen in your day-to-day -day of how this system is impacting financial inclusion and exclusion? Maha, perhaps we can, we can start with you. Good morning, good evening, and uh, I'm more than happy to be today with you because I can give an idea about the real uh, case of uh, resistance and the problems. Um, in reality, especially when we talk about the most vulnerable, whether we're talking about forcibly displaced, for example, in Jordan, we have uh, almost 30% of the population are forcibly displaced. Even the resistance is higher, the risk is more augmented. I believe there should be some kind of guidance uh, towards UNHCR as the official state of the segment. So they don't have their uh, official uh, documents from their homelands. And uh, even with the uh, UNHCR, they are uh, really uh, like um, violated, their human rights are violated. So that was the start of my journey with facing the difficulties of implementing FATF. And I started my commitment towards investigating how much the regulator and the incumbents and others are facing uh, problems in implementing. So I started my research. Standards, some areas are not really very clear to the regulator or the market participants. When they allow us, like it's voluntarily, you can do this, the regulator cannot take this uh, responsibility or take this liability. So the regulator would put open statement policy. One of them, risk-based approach. Okay, risk-based approach. As a service provider, how can I implement this? I go to the regulator, the regulator cannot help me. Okay. How can I assess Isabella as high risk and Maha lower risk, depending on which criteria? They improvise, they do their best, but in reality, they cannot take this responsibility. So I used to brag over the last decade that in Jordan, I implemented tiering KYC and simplification for KYC, especially for mobile wallets. But in reality, that wasn't the case. Uh, more documentation, more proofs and evidences. Even when the regulator conduct inspection over this sector, they always have concerns. The uh, mutual evaluation report, uh, they contain in, or consist of explicitly uh, like criticism to the, uh, the practice, to the real practice. So how can we do? We are really crippled. We cannot facilitate people. We are violating their human rights. We are exceed, expanding the problem. 
this is one area, but another area, Isabella, I really need to focus on. It, it's not only access to financial services. I started working on this project when the uh, financial uh, inclusion rate in Jordan was 24.6%. Now we exceeded 60% of financial inclusion, but still this is not really helping because the usage, the adoption is more important. Having a bank account or formal uh, wallet does not help me. If I don't have usages, I will still go to the informal market to conduct the transactions. So many of the areas, I don't want to take longer time, but this is like high level. And not only in Jordan, I'm not only talking about Jordan. I went to Lebanon to investigate and had several meetings to other countries in the region, even those who have high financial inclusion rate, but they have a huge number of expats and workers. Still, the problem is there, even if we don't want to uh, announce that we have this problem. In the guidance or in the recommendations, in the policy of the regulator and in practice, how to implement. Thank you, Maha. You've touched on a number of really important high level points there. Barry, I was wondering if I could come to you next. Semfri works across a number of countries. You have really a really long history in this area. Do you do the problems that Maha uh, raises sound familiar? This problem with not having enough clarity in the regulations. Absolutely, uh, it's uh, there's a catalog. Of, I mean, everybody uh, we assume positive intent, but then you look look at at what's been implemented. It's it's really really dysfunctional. Um, and it's not only just uh, an, a lot of issues in the present, um, there's this whole legacy of issues and of methodologies that um, get woven into the fabric of, of, of what happens in a, in, a, in a jurisdiction. It's very difficult to change that. So, so you've got this whole legacy of issues um, and, and often it's, it's so dysfunctional. What, what it does is it, uh, it reduces the, the, the um, footprint and scale of financial services which really mitigates against, uh, against inclusion because it becomes expensive and, and often um, the, the cost of compliance we, we've seen is, is it's eating up like 60 per, 60% of the cost of compliance is just on CDD alone. And many, many of, of the exercises or in, in our view is a fool's mission because it doesn't mitigate risk really. So, so you, you've got a whole lot of these issues stacking up and what is the root cause? I mean, there's, there's uh, predominantly, and, and, and I agree with Maha, is, is, is that, that it's, um, it's lack of uh, of guidance and and re, 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 uh, you know certain regulations. Um, I mean, we when we we go into a country, we ne inevitably have to re redo the legislation, regulation, and then the guidance, particularly uh, in in order just to get the the system on 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 the right track. No, that that sounds like an awful lot of work, but um, very important work to do, Adam. Um, You've worked quite extensively in, in a grey listed country and, and no pressure to say which one, but um, I'd be really interested to hear, in, in addition to your general thoughts of the impact of FATF on financial inclusion, how maybe that element of the FATF framework can impact financial inclusion in the country. Uh, before I answer this, uh, this question, I, I just wanted to share some details. And I think this, this should provide a, an explanation <clears throat> why not only the local regulators are not willing to share a very precise guidelines in terms of how we should be assessing the risk of our customers and how the, the customer due diligence process should look like. So the numbers are the FATF budget for 2020 is below 12 million euro. It's a body that establishes standards globally. Uh, recently, just last week, one of the financial crime service providers the company issued a, a, a survey, issued a report about the global cost of FinCrime compliance. Uh, the issue is that the, the report is based on the answers from 1,000, more than 1,000 people, compliance people responsible for financial crime, and it covers just a part of the world. Not all of the global, not all of the countries are involved. The cost of compliance with financial crime is uh, above 220 billion globally. When we compare the cost of, of compliance on the private end, yes, what the, the, the financial institutions, and in this case, it were banks, wealth management companies, and insurance companies that they bear, it's uh, above uh, 200 billion per year. 
with a budget of of uh, of a tariff, which is as I've said below twelve million euros, we see a huge discrepancy. And the reason why I wanted to bring this fact on the table is, I feel that um, there is a not enough scientific approach in the so-called fight with financial crime. It's just. Uh, uh, it's just that the, the documents and the standards that are being drafted, but also the laws and then guidelines issued by, by specific local regulators based on those standards are just very, very general in their nature. And then when it comes to auditing of financial companies, uh, it's all about the so-called finding specific cases of non-compliance and then issuing penalties. So it seems that the whole burden of fighting, not whole, but the, the vast majority of the burden of, or the cost of fighting with financial crime was put on the financial sector, on the private sector. And lots of issues that could be more effectively tackled by the public sector are again, shifted to, 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 to private sector. The same with uh, the so-called uh, centralized uh, registers of ultimate beneficial owners where Supposedly, that was a tool that should have helped us, a private sector, when identifying uh, ultimately beneficial owners. But at the, in the end, for example, in Europe or in case in Poland these days, uh, financial institutions are obliged to report discrepancies between the central register and their findings, and not only report the discrepancy, but also document them and justify those discrepancies. So this is exactly this, this responsibility being shifted to, to the private sector. Uh, and then coming back to your original question, uh, from my perspective, the, the biggest impact was basically when it comes to not necessarily even the, 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 the financial inclusion because the banking, the, the, the percentage of population that was banked in the country that I was working for was really high, but the costs of financial services were increasing on one hand, and especially the costs of international transfers and remittances at some stage, they were way above what the, the local population could afford. And that's why, for example, Havala systems or the so-called informal value transfer systems were quite popular in the country. So statistics, again, of bank population look really good in the country. However, the costs are driving the, the good, good actors, meaning uh, an average Joe from, from a given country, from a financial, from the official financial sector to unofficial one. Maho and Barry, you were both nodding a lot through that. I was just wondering before I ask my next question, if you'd like to respond to anything that Adam was saying there. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We, we, we see it uh, very often. Um, so when, when, the, when the, the, it becomes difficult for, for low, low risk um, ordinary consumers to, to gain access to, to financial services, and it becomes or, or either there's, there's, there's um, a really uh, not, uh, not, not well thought through barriers, or the way it's been implemented, or, or um, you know, there, there's some some other aspects with, with regard to where a person lives or whatever. It it uh, feeds this this uh, informal sector, and in in one one jurisdiction, what we noticed is that the the amount of of formal remittances was was trickling down to I think it was about 250 million. Eventually, it trickled down to like seven million US dollars. And the the um, uh, government agency that looks at the, the diaspora estimates that between five to seven billion US dollars is is, is going in. It's feeding the, these uh, uh, the uh, illicit flows. It's feeding trade trade based money laundering. It's, it's feeding all kinds of other illicit activities. And you're really just uh, uh, pulling the public into into an, an illicit activity. So if, yeah, uh, absolutely, we 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 see that. And uh, and it's not that. Um, in, uh, informal services are are uh, you know less less efficient. That they're very sophisticated in mo most cases, more sophisticated and more efficient than than formal services, and they're not on a level playing field. They don't have to comply. Yeah, uh, it's it's for, for me it's a, it's a, it's a growing issue. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, the informal market is by far more efficient than the formal market because they don't need to comply with many restrictions and regulations. They innovate. I remember working in one of the countries and uh, uh, they told me, no, go this alley to another alley. So I managed to conduct cross-border remittance in seconds. 
While if I wanted at the time to do it through the official channels, it would take me a, a, a days and a huge cost and etc. So, and when we finished the transfer, it sent the instructions to a shredder. I witnessed that, and I was so scared. I am a central banker. You are asked. You are asking me to transfer official amount and the formal clean amount. In, and believe me, Hawala is the first uh, system in the world uh, similar to blockchain. It's a blockchain-based system, extremely efficient, extremely uh, uh, appealing to all customers. So why not to go into a better thing? Even countries like Jordan and many others, uh, we need uh, efficient ecosystem to uh, our GDP growth and to optimize the benefits and resources, limited resources. So the compliance cost is not justified. It's tremendously not justified. I can comply. I can respect the spirit. It's not about how the terms and regulations and standards are stated as words. It's not a checklist. Even with these restrictions, I can comply. I can 100% comply. But this is not what we want. Honestly, we want a, a, an ecosystem with high integrity and efficiency. When I launched in Jordan instant payment system, part of the discussion with the banks, they told me, no, 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 we will not allow, we, we are not in. Why? Because I cannot. Uh, implement instant payment system even for micropayments without having full due diligence and I monitor every single transaction. This is micropayments. The bank answered me, even if it is one JD, I will not allow uh, seamless and uh, straight through processing. The regulator allows, or oh, even if the regulator allows, I cannot take this risk. My compliance department will not allow me. So I think there's a huge uh, work should be done in this area because the compliance cost is not justified. This is what I say. I'm willing to put compliance costs. I'm willing to comply to protect our financial ecosystem and to protect our uh, countries, but not just to comply a checklist, refusing to conduct any business, having a huge opportunity cost, pushing the uh, economic agents to conduct their transaction in the shadow economy, informal market instead of formal, I would thank any system that would really allow me to see the suspicious transactions. I should promote them and reward them because in the shadow economy, I cannot see, not even fatal, nothing, unless something wrong happens and after investigation, but maybe I can protect this before happening or after a few flow of funds before it becomes like significant. That's my opinion. No, absolutely. And you touched on a really important point there, both Barry and you, the point around, of course, the FATF system is made up of two elements, the technical compliance, but also the effectiveness. And I feel there's so much focus on the technical compliance and, and there's trying to have this this culture shift towards effectiveness and really as we believe at Roos, you know, an effective compliance with uh, the FATF system, you wouldn't have problems like financial exclusion because as you say, Mahar, it's crucial for the integrity and the effectiveness of the system to, to include people. But a key barrier and I think a problem area that we talk about a lot when we're thinking about FATF and financial inclusion is this issue of simplified due diligence, which you have also, you've all alluded to. I was just wondering if before we move on to thinking about solutions, is there, what are, what are the main barriers to simplify due diligence? We've spoken that there is not enough regulatory cap clarity, but is that it? Or is there more to this problem of simplified due diligence than a lack of detail in the regulations or in the standards themselves? Barry, would you like to go first? Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the simplified, simplified due diligence is, is, always, is always an option, but it's not, it's it's not compelled. So enhanced due diligence is compelled, but simplified due diligence isn't. And also, um, uh, there is no restriction in 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 not accepting people into the system. So uh, effectively, de-risking customers. So there's no there's no consumer rights. There's no consumer framework, and where, whereby people 
uh, we don't we don't even consider wh whether people need to be part of the economic system. We allow to just delete them like like a cell on an Excel sheet. So 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 that 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 the, those those issues for, for for me are are, are important because um, I mean if if you look at simplified due diligence, you you put you as a as a regulator as an institution you put yourself at risk when you when you do simplified due diligence. You don't do that with enhanced due diligence or just with standard due diligence. So and and uh, just the the uh, the requirements of simplified simplified due diligence. Um, yeah, the, the, the risk grading of customers is also a, a big issue. If, if we go into the individual institutions, which we do, and we look at how they, they grade their customers, I mean, the kinds of risks are, are, are just putative risks that have never occurred. There's no evidence base of that. It's just something that somebody dreamt up. And, uh, and, and often, yes, some, some of them are, are risks and some of them are, are, are validly, but most of the risks are not accurately monitored or understood. Um, and and you, you end up with, uh, I mean, two thirds of the of the of the client base in medium risk and some in high risk and and, and almost none in uh, in uh, in in lower risk, uh, which which is absurd because people of they they low income people with with very predictable um, uh, uh, financial habits. So yeah, and, and it means it means that the the way people perceive risk uh, and the the uh, the pressures that that not only the regulators. But the correspondent banking uh, fraternity and external regulators or other jurisdictions put on institutions uh, is always in the way of more compliance, more, more, uh, more uh, ostensible compliance. In other words, let's count the, the, the number of identity documents that, 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 we, that, we've, uh, that we've got. Let's count other things, not let's, let's really understand the risk and understand you know, how, how people can be facilitated into the economy, not out of the economy. Absolutely, I would totally agree with that, Barry. Maha, did you want to come in on that point as well? Yes, uh, in Jordan, we have central registry and we have accurate and very precise, comprehensive uh, national identity for individuals and for even legal entities. But still, you know, some of the data change how much these central registries can cover any updates or this is a huge devi deviation and difference among different countries and regions in the world. So it's not about having uh, full documentation or having uh, accurate uh, identity. It's about how they understand the risks, how they can calculate the risks, how they do this risk-based. Uh, so I, I believe we can work together on many of the areas to enable that, that um, what they use as cause uh, as uh, reasons or causes, but the real cause is the mentality and the legacy. Believe me, with as long as FATF would not adjust or announce a specific guidance, how to calculate, how to do, or na uh, national uh, regulators, uh, the, the mentality is like more and more. The culture is more and more within incumbents or within the government. No more of requirements. As a central bank in Jordan, we work as a bank to the government, not only bank for the bank. So we are the bank for the government. They are now implementing AML CFT standards on the government itself. The same way they apply it on any individual. Why? Only because they want the ranking of Jordan to become better. Come on, am I going to transfer money to launder my money with the Treasury Department or the Customs Department? Come on, there's there's no rationale behind it except except the result of having better ranking. As a student, it's not I just study to have a good grade at the exam, even if I don't understand anything. So this is not the case. I, allow me to express the real pain. The pain in the market is really significant and we will keep on suffering. The longer the regulator and the incumbents are like more of controlling everything. Controlling don't allow zero risk appetite. Sorry, zero risk appetite, close and go back home. Uh... 
Absolutely. I mean, yes. And the question, I suppose, is how do we shift that culture from more and more to just better, right? Because more doesn't equal effective. As we all know, we, we have this huge problem of too many SARS. You can't possibly go through them all and, and get any information from it. So we know more isn't better. How do we shift from quantity to quality? And I think maybe technology has a really interesting role to play there. Um, Adam, before we move on to looking at some solutions, I was wondering in your experience, if you have any, uh, other, any other elements of, of simplified due diligence that are problematic or maybe any thoughts on how we can use technology to overcome this issue? I think the issue is quite simple. I mean, the, the regulations and the standards say that an SDD can be applied whenever we are dealing with a situation of a lower risk of financial crime, be it money laundering, terrorism financing, or, or from recently proliferation financing. Uh, the issue is that uh, that's my understanding from my previous experience, but also from, from my colleagues and panelists, that what financial institutions are afraid of is a fear that the regulatory risk of application of a simplified due diligence is considerably higher than actually a financial crime risk, yes? Because it's, it's probably more inevitable that at some stage, the regulator would, not, would knock on our doors and would question the, the underlying reasons we, we or underlying justifications we have applied for, for an application of uh, simplified due diligence. And I think that, uh, that the problem here is fear, but obviously we, need, we would have to concentrate uh, where is this fear coming from? And fr from my understanding, and I'll just keep repeating it, uh, we need a more scientific approach in the area of financial crime, in the area of money laundering risk, terrorism financing risk, or, or proliferation risk. I mean, and for, from my perspective, a good example is a bank of international settlements that issues multiple guidelines with respect to how other types of risks, like financial risks, should be managed and measured. There is value at risk measure for, for, for financial risk, which is, I mean, it has its deficiencies, but it's globally recognized and globally applied. And then when we are talking about risks or credit risk, when we mention a measure we apply, everybody then understands, understands what we are really talking about. Probably if myself and then Barry and Maha would start talking about money laundering risk, the way we've seen, we've seen how it is being calculated in our previous experiences, probably it would look completely different in each of our uh, cases. So we are not, even though we are using same words, we're not talking about the same things. And that's, uh, I mean, that's a global problem. And I, I truly believe that that scientific approach is, is needed. And I, I, I recently read a book and there is this statement and I, I wanted just to bring it up to your attention which says that from the perspective of risk management, various risk management practices, what we basically apply in many areas in financial crime area and money laundering risk, we design and external vendors design these matrices, yes, those risk matrices with those various colors, et cetera. And, and the issue is, and, and I find it a, a really big issue is the fact that something has a structure like risk matrices doesn't mean that it brings any value, that it brings any problems because that it solves any problems. And there is a good comparison. Astrology has a structure in it, but it doesn't mean that it's a science. And same is, uh, sometimes I feel that same is with, with, with our industry. We have a structure in it. We talk about risks, but I mean, we are talking continuously, we are talking about different things and the way we, we have developed our risk management practices with regard to the, to the risk, which is undefined from my perspective, because I, I, I some time ago was on a mission to read that of documents and to find a clear definition of what money laundering risk is. And I couldn't, I mean, I'm, maybe I, I haven't found the right document, but I couldn't really find a, a proper definition of, of what money laundering risk is. So I think it all boils down to the, to the foundations. Uh, and once we, once we continue just building up on foundations that are not stable, I mean, we can't expect that the system will be, uh, will be efficient. So, uh, and just a, a final comment, 
FARA fees, and not only FARA, but local regulations are continuously expanding, expanding, including uh, adding additional uh, the so-called obliged institutions, yes? So today we are talking about financial exclusion in the context of financial institutions. But I'm just wondering whether in five years time, on 10 years time, we'll just wake up to, to see that the problem with financial exclusion or in general with services exclusion uh, is in, in other uh, industries that are just recently were added to, to the list of the so-called obliged institutions that have to comply with, with AML regulations. Because the reason is, if you are a new industry and you need to address these various requirements and all of them are quite very new to you, you don't have knowledge and experience, the easiest solution, which does not cost you too much, is to just exclude part of your potential customer base and not to have to deal with, with the complexities that you're not uh, able to, to comprehend with your experience. So that's my comment. Thank you very much for it. And I hope, Diego, that goes some way in answering your question about information asymmetry is the answer is everyone's doing it differently. So it, it's hard for uh, information to be consistent, I suppose, in that way. But moving on uh, and to begin to answer Andrew's question here, we, we've spoken about the problem and we all know that there is a problem here. FATF itself knows that there is a problem, hence the unintended consequences project, but uh, let, let's be positive, let's look for some solutions, and let's put ourselves in the shoes of FATF. How do we go about reversing this unintended consequence? And I'm going to ask you from the perspective of what does the private sector need to do, what do regulators need to do, and what do we need from FATF and international standard setters? So starting with MAHO, private sector, what do you need? And just to encourage our audience, if you have any other questions, please do continue them to come in. I think we need the front FATF to uh, start publishing and putting what Adam mentioned, some of the scientific approaches, detailed guidance. And maybe I want to raise the bar, maybe I want to be more restrictive than them, but at least this guidance will allow uh, harmony and the uh, level playing field even among different uh, institutions, different countries, because this is a very important one. Another thing I uh, think I believe that it should work maybe on the assessors themselves, because at the end of the day, we care about the assessor and what they would uh, publish about us or write about us. So maybe the assessors should also follow a kind of criteria or in specific uh, methodology, I'm sure they have. But at the end of the day, depending on some differences between different assessors, so maybe there should be a more of awareness and training to, uh, to assessors in different jurisdictions so they can uh, witness and sense the differentiations. Uh, FATF maybe should build better relationship with the regulators in different countries in terms of ensuring comprehensive and better understanding of the policy makers in these countries. And I'm not only talking about financial regulators, because we have many of the areas where might take place of illicit finance uh, or illicit transactions in other areas like lands or anything. So many of the things I think they should at least uh, ensure a minimum level of very full and comprehensive understanding from uh, the regulators. As uh, BIS uh, do, the regulator should transfer this knowledge and share it with the uh, public sector and private sector uh, and to build strong uh, awareness, strong culture among them. To reverse that, uh, many, uh, much work and many uh, of the initiatives should be on a roadmap, how to work in a more scientific way, way with a specific timeline, because as I mentioned, the longer we keep on within our, uh, the trend or the previous uh, methodology, I think the problem will become uh, more uh, deeper and deeper and reversing it would not be uh, the case. 
technology, as you mentioned, will help in many of the areas, but I still believe in having at least something scientific to follow, then implementing technology or without technology, we can have better results. Mm, that's really interesting. Um, Barry, from your perspective, what do you think or what do you need from regulators when you uh, in the future going forward when you're helping different countries to balance financial crime and financial inclusion objectives? What do you think regulators need to, to meet that balance better? Well, f f first of all, um, I don't think there's a, there's a balance in the two. These, the, these things are, 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 are supporting. Um, so th there's, a, there's a perception that you trade off uh, on financial crime if you, if you have financial inclusion. But actually, what we're seeing is that um, uh, financial integrity can actually drive financial inclusion. We've seen that in some markets, and, and you, you go and speak to some some of the institutions. Uh, so, 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 so that 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 for me is 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 a is is one way that we've seen work. Um, it's where it's where the regulators uh, within the, there's multiple regulators that that, that are that are um, are impacted. The regulators don't speak to each other. The the, the regional bodies and the and the regulators uh, you know fa fairly fairly irregularly meet. Uh, it's about creating that 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 contact and, 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 and creating this community of faith but between them. They don't just sit, sit in isolated pockets and particularly uh, putting the regulators in the same room as the, as, as the institutions is, has been really mind blowing because what comes out of that are, are these forums, regular contact and it, it, the, these statements that we all on, on, this, on this road together. Um, I would really guard against if there's any kind of like templates uh, because the tyranny of templates is, is what is what we we try and and uh, unearth or, or or get out of uh, of systems. A lot of a lot of the the foundational uh, or the roots of, of issues um, arise from these cut and paste templates, cut and paste legislation. It's inappropriate for the jurisdiction, inappropriate for the region. Um, even the even the, the the type of law, it's it's kind of in a, inappropriate for. Um, often it's been bargained through uh, the legislative assembly. It means very little. So so. You know those kinds of templates are are, are harmful. It, it's a, it's about finding a fit for purpose, of appropriate, effective um, solution in, in in a country. Uh, I think to to a degree the the, the, the fat of recommendations have have emerged and 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 uh, are, are are getting getting to a point where, where they are are, are uh, you know reasonably fit for purpose. It's the implementation that that this so higher degree of guidance. Um, and particularly uh, Im important points of, of guidance, but, you know, for instance, um, proof of address and all the, these kinds of things, which which are seem very logical in uh, in de developed markets, are completely um, you know alien in, in a market where we don't have sur surveyed addresses. You know, it, it's it's really allowing this these approaches to to adapt, and but also reining in the developed market. Um, uh, financial service sector that is imposing on 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 developed uh, developing markets uh, imposing their 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 jurisdictional requirements on uh, within another jurisdiction that so i think it's it's more in implementation it's it's understanding that these things do not just exist in isolation you you can't just template uh, create a template and 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 uh, but definitely a scientific approach and a view, uh, I think, is, is absolutely necessary because majority of what we see, and particularly in, in risk assessments, is, is, is completely not scientific. I, I had uh, two actuaries looking at this, and, that, and they, were, they were horrified about, about what passes as risks. So, so yeah, it, it's, 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 more, it's more fears than, than, than risks that have been in, in incorporated, and that, that, that's a problem. It's the conflation of different risks, like as we as we discussed earlier, the um, uh, compliance risk being conflated with with money laundering risk or proliferation risk, um, and then the 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 uh, the remedy that compliance uh, measures will 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 affect the others, um, and that's we've just seen just far too often is a tick box approach, compliance based uh, approach, and that's pervasive. Uh, I think at some point we need to start. Um, creating guidance in separating out the, the different risks. Um, you know, it's difficult to actually define those risks for for any particular jurisdiction. But I think we can have broad broad guidelines in in in, de in defining the defining those risks, deconflating those risks, and appropriate measures. Um, yeah, uh, I think. But uh, yeah, that that takes a lot of nuance, and it, within each jurisdiction. 
and with each uh, each region, it it is very very different. Thank you, Barry. And yes, no, I think we always have to remember that that it's um, the world is not an even place, right? So I'll actually I'll, I'll um, Adam, I was going to ask you, what do you think uh, we need from international standard setters to improve this problem? But I, I feel like you've already answered that a little bit, but if you have um, more to add on it. I mean, I was just wondering, because I feel like you're very thoughtful about this topic. As we've just pointed to there, it's hard to have one template. The world is uneven. Do you think we should be a bit more tiered in our approaches to different countries around the world and their capacity to manage and implement the, the FATF system? Or is it right to only have one system for everyone? Uh I, answering this this question, I would say I believe we should, and then the the way we could achieve this, and these are just my quick thoughts. But when when reading mutual evaluation reports, and I've read a few, uh, basically the, the vast majority of the content within the report is uh, is a detailed description of the technical compliance, and then obviously description of the of the effectiveness of the system, and then. Uh, a judgment is being made, yes, whether a country should be put on, a, on an enhanced monitoring program or maybe gray listed. I believe that this, th those findings should be put in the context. And when I've read, I actually yesterday read a, a fad of document about the methodology of conducting uh, uh, those uh, evaluation uh, missions. And uh, the document seems to me, the narrative is correct because the document states that the risk, that, that the, the technical compliance, but also the effectiveness of the system should be assessed in the context of risks or let's call them threats within a given country, yes? Uh, and I have a feeling when I've read, so I, before I've read the mutual evaluation methodology, I've read mutual evaluation reports. And to me, I haven't seen this, this, this fact of putting those effectiveness scores and technical compliance in the context of threats that are prevalent in, in a given country. And I think that's what's missing because a country, a, a relatively small country with relatively small exposure to an external world in terms of international transfers and remittances can have when compared or benchmarked to large financial centers, let's say, might have a poor, yes, uh, technical compliance and effectiveness. But does that really mean that it poses a significant risk to international financial community or integrity of the financial sector, yes, global financial sector. And my answer is, I mean, like uh, a basic answer is probably not, yes. We, so for me, what we are missing is putting these findings into respective context of threats, but also the, the sheer size of the economy and how this could impact the, the integrity of the global financial system. But because what FATF is looking at is, is looking at the integrity of the financial system on a global level, yes, on a global perspective. So that's first thought. And the second thought I just wanted to, to, to since I have a chance and I don't have this chance too often, I thought that some, there are some quick fixes or quick measures that could be taken and from my perspective is the way the FATF communicates uh, with the world. And from my perspective, one thing could be changed pretty quickly. So when a mutual evaluation report is, uh, is published, it's public. When the follow-up reports are published, it's public. But follow-up reports, they contain only information about the changes in the so-called technical compliance. Whereas at the same time, countries are taking measures to improve their effectiveness. And unfortunately, the so-called effectiveness scores are updated only every, let's say, five years when the so-called full mutual evaluation report is published. So what it really, what FATF, what kind of message FATF sends to the world is that this given country, when it comes to the effectiveness, let's say it's poor, whereas from the last evaluation period, let's assume that three or four, it was it took place four years ago, there were significant improvements that were achieved, but FATF wouldn't tell this to the world, yes? And, and then decision makers at various correspondent banks or other stakeholders, since they have no visibility of how these 
uh, effectiveness scores are changing in time. They are actually making their decisions whether to exit a country really on an outdated information. So I think that some, that this is something, this is a fix that could be hopefully quickly implemented to improve the situation. Thank you. I think that, that's a really interesting idea. And also your point around country context and risk, I think is really important. And I, I'm just trying to think how you would square that circle. Is it up to someone to make a, a list of all the countries and how financial crime risky they are? But uh, I'm sure that's, that will be for someone else to think about. Um, I wanted to turn to a couple of the questions that we have coming in from our audience. And uh, the first from Tom Keating. I was just wondering if any of you have any experience of civil society uh, working with national supervisors to boost uh, the, the sort of the profile of financial inclusion and whether that's an effective channel. Barry, I wonder in your work if you if you ever see um, civil society helping to, to bridge the gap maybe between consumers well, and private sector and... Well, we, we are part of civil society, so... Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, definitely. So what, 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 we, what we've often found is, is that it does need... The, the, you do need a catalyst to, um, in, in order to, to, to settle these things straight. You also need some, um, institutions that, that are, or, or expertise that, is, that, that are outside of, the, of, of, that, of that jurisdiction because that, you know, they don't have... They don't have a a, um, a, a, a stake in, in, in what in what's happening. Uh, yeah. So yeah, um, but it, it is it, it's it's very very difficult to to do that in the, in those certain circumstances because you're also not invested in that in that uh, in, in that jurisdiction. You don't understand the nuances of, of, of what happens there. But it's, but definitely, I think most of these the the, the change, the positive change you see, um, would it would have been um, civil society in one form or another be, be behind it. Great, thank you. And and just another question here. Um, the FATF standards do not seem to be subject to, um, I think that's a regulatory impact assessment. Does anyone see any uh, examples of national uh, of impact assessments of the implementation of FATF standards at a national level? I actually was asked this question the other day and I, and I do know that the European Union has impact assessments for their directives and so does the UK government for their money laundering regulations. Both do have cursory mentions of financial inclusion in them. What are our views of impact assessments in all of this? Would that be a helpful development? Yeah, regulatory impact assessments are, are, are actually quite difficult to, to, to do if you do them thoroughly. Uh, and it takes a lot, a lot of expertise and, 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 and funding. And, and often that, that you, you don't find that, it, I mean, th there's not, there's rudimentary funding for for FICs and for and for regulators. Um, many of them uh, don't have a consistency of funding. Um, some of them uh, that we've interviewed, uh, I mean, they've only got a stationary budget. That's about it. So, so yeah, I mean, yes, re regulatory uh, inc um, re regulatory impact assessments would would really uh, help, particularly in, in effectiveness. And, and but we we don't see that, and it it falls on. Uh, institutions that, like us and, and others um, to uh, effectively engage with with the the, the legislature, the uh, the policymakers, and that to to change to change the regulation, to change the legislation, um, and because often that, that's at the foundation of, of some of, some of the the, um, the the issues that we find. Mm. Yes, I think also you know one point that has kept on coming up today is this issue of cost, and I think we all know the cost of compliance is extreme, but I. I do really agree with Adam's point that you made earlier, you know, and I, I know that uh, Mike has countered it in, in the Q&A, but we do know that FATF has a really small budget and it doesn't have that many people. Of course, there are the auxiliary parts of it, but it's sort of an, an interesting, do we grow this framework into something much, much bigger and, and fund it accordingly? Or does it just sit there as a principle setting body and that cost, as we say, is passed on to other entities that, ultimately there that isn't fair because capacity differs massively around the world um but i'm i'm mindful of time and uh i promise that we, we, we love to, to finish on time at, at half past so to do so um i'd like to give you each a moment for final remarks and if you'd like to respond to the point about cost please do and in doing so also if you could give us one point 
that you think should come out of the FATF Unintended Consequences project? I know we've listed a few just now, but if you could have your one wish answered, what would you like to see coming out of that project and any final remarks you have? Maha, let's, let's start with you. As, as we mentioned, I would love to see uh, detailed guidance, more awareness and the scientific way. That's my wish list. Short and sweet and easy to understand. So yes, no, I think that that's excellent. Barry, let's go to you next. No, absolutely. De de detailed, detailed guidance, I think, is is, a, is the is the key key element that that, that there was missing. Um, I mean, just the, the guidance on, on uh, identity proofing. Uh, it came out. It was the timing was impeccable for 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 COVID, but really, really superb guidance. Uh, but more on on that. Particularly, um, my big wish would be um, to to not regard remote onboarding um, as as higher risk, because you know. Just, Factually, scientifically, this is, this is it's, it's actually much lower risk. So um, yeah, so, so that's more guidance, and and, and also uh, the, the the current process of, of feeding into FATF, I think, has been has been superb. Um, it's it's a very different organisation that, that we're encountering. Absolutely, I think we can only really. It, it I think it's just so excellent how collaborative FATF has been over the past twenty four months. Plus, uh, just the fact that we are having this conversation in response to an unintended consequences project is excellent and is really just a sign of the, the current spirit of collaboration, which, as you say, um, can only be praised. Adam, what is your, your one ask and any final comments? Uh, I'll be brief this time. Uh, it's scientific approach. And uh, I believe that the, the extension of the present presidency of FATF was a good, it was a step into the right direction because uh, it allows the, the president, the new incumbent to plan changes or plan enhancements within the two year time span, uh, which is, which in theory creates a room for more comprehensive changes. Because historically what I was seeing was a new president when being elected and then stepping up, they always had to put some new items on the agenda to show how, how proactive a new president is and then to be able to show some successes at the, at the very end of, the, of, of a term. And I believe the change of the cadence is, is a step into the right direction. And I hope that this, this opportunity, which was created, will be used for, for fixing the foundations, yes, then applying the most scientific, more science, scientific approach to the to the risks that that FATF uh, tries to mitigate globally. Absolutely, I definitely agree with you. Um, and before we close, I just have a moment of shameful promotion, um, which is that we at RUSI have spent the last eighteen months doing a project on FATF and financial inclusion, and we've published two papers from that project in June that can be found on the RUSI website. They both look back at the impacts of FATF on financial inclusion to date, and then also uh, list five recommendations. So you can hear my top five things that, that we think that FATF should do to be more financially inclusive. Before we close, um, I'd just like to remind you, there we go, get the slides to work, um, that if you'd like to find out more about our event series on unintended consequences, you can find uh, the first in this series on our website and YouTube channel. And the third and final event will be taking place next Thursday at exactly the same time, 2.30 British summer time. And it will look ahead at how FATF standards might be abused in the future. Of course, if you're interested in finding anything else out about the CFCS, our publication, podcasts and events, I'd recommend going over to rusi.org forward slash CFCS where you can sign up for our newsletter or you can follow us on our social media channels where you will get all of our regular updates. That just leads me to say a huge thank you to our panellists for sharing their insights today. It's been fascinating as always. Um, and to my colleague Olivia for doing all the behind the scenes organization on this event, as well as to Rusi events for their help as well. So thank you so much for everyone who attended and once again to our excellent panel.